Welcome Downsview. Good morning. It is very good for us to be able to join across the miles this way on the Lord's Day to worship our King, to seek to honor His name amongst us, and that we as God's people, apart and yet organically together, would be able to worship our King in spirit and in truth. Listen to the Word of God as we begin our service this morning from Psalm 86. The psalm writer says this, Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my life, for I am godly. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you do I cry all the day. Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, I do lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good, and forgiving, bounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my plea for grace. In the day of trouble, in the day of my trouble, I call upon you, for you answer me. Isn't that a great way to put that? That he pleads, gladden the soul of your servant. And he is made glad because he knows that in the day of his difficulty, as he calls on the Lord for grace, that he has every expectation that he will receive it. What good news for this morning. We're going to ask Grant Hallett to come now, and he's going to open our service with a word of prayer this morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our morning service. Let's begin our service this morning in a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank thee for your faithfulness over this past week. We thank thee, our Father, that once again, we can gather on the internet like this and to worship you in spirit and in truth. We just thank thee for being able to gather together like this, and we just pray as we meet and the pastor preaches your word as we worship. May we sense your presence. May you direct our service and use your name to be glorified in our midst. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. everyone. Glad to see you here today for worship. Let's get started with a call to worship from Psalm 47. This is Psalm 47, verses 5 through 9. God has gone up with a shout. The Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our King. Sing praises. 
For God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises with a psalm. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the people gather as the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. Let's worship. perfect refuge, yet we seek out safety in many other things, in careers, in family, in homes, in friends, and all of these are amazing gifts you've given us, but none can provide the security you provide. So we ask that you would keep our dependency solely on you so that we can be truly grateful for all those other things without reservation. Amen. Now let's read from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Yeah. 
nothing to life everlasting He passed and we follow Him there Over us and no more have dominion For more than conquerors we are Turn your eyes upon Jesus Look full in his wonderful face And the things of earth will grow strangely dim In the light of his glory and grace Ten filled blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins And sinners plunged beneath that flood Lose all their guilty stains Lose all their guilty stains Sinners plunge beneath that flood Lose all the guilty stains The dying thief rejoices sins away washed all my sins away washed all my sins away and there have I though as he washed all my sins away
has been my theme and shall be till I die. We pray with me. Lord, we pray the words from Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Well, friends, thank you again for being part of the worship service today. We do have the opportunity for a few announcements for our church family in terms of what we are seeking, seeking to continue to do here in the life and the body at Downsview Baptist Church. Thank you again, friends, that you take advantage of our two congregational connections, at least our online congregational connections. We meet on Sunday evenings, so tonight at 6 o'clock. We have a congregational Zoom meeting. We have uh, done that a number of times now. and We've had a good turnout each time. We recognize it's a long weekend tonight, but if you'd like to come six o'clock tonight, the Zoom link is on the email you would have got from me yesterday, or just email me or text me before six o'clock tonight, and I'll be happy to send you that link. It's just a good time for us to see and hear from one another, hear about the grace of God in each other's lives, how God is sustaining us, as well as to be sharing some of the things that we can implore the Lord for on our behalf. Wednesday evenings, we meet at seven o'clock on Facebook Live. Just go to my Facebook page there or watch for the link in your email again. Uh, 7 o'clock on Wednesday evenings. It's a good time to have a number of folks pop in. We're able to interact at least on the comment bar and share uh, comments and thoughts on the lesson that we will be doing. We began last week to explore in more detail the aspects of covenant partnership or church membership here at Downsview. Some of the reasons why we do that. Some of the commitments that are are bringing joy into people's lives as they find themselves all the more connected in a covenant partnership way here at Downsview. And so we'll continue that series on this Wednesday evening. It's a little more of a teaching session. We're not able to interact um, with voice and, and uh, sight to see each other the way we do on our Zoom calls, but it's been a good time for us to be together as well. So six o'clock tonight, seven o'clock on Wednesday night. We want to thank you again for those of you who have taken the time to really encourage us as your leaders. This is an odd time, obviously. We notice that the restrictions for isolations are slowly being removed and we believe they should be slowly being removed. We're glad for that. We commend our governing authorities and health authorities for taking their time. We do intend at Downsview to take our time. We're not about to rush back your safety and the witness to the community, both for love of our neighbors and submitting to our governing authorities are important uh, priorities here for us at Downsview. And so our sense is we may be away from one another for quite some time yet, nevertheless, Please avail yourself of the way that God in His common grace and His providential working is allowing some of these restrictions to come down. One of the things that we do recognize in the midst of these restrictions is that it's been hard for us to meet. And one of the things that we do when we do meet together is we not only pray and praise God and hear the teaching of the Word and enjoy our fellowship, but we fund our ministry. The only way this ministry is funded at our church over the years has been what goes into these plates on Sunday morning. Now, we have been threatening for some time to have an e-transfer system set up, and by God's grace, we're ready to go. Some of you may have got an email already. We hope that a good number of you will be getting our uh, correspondence that will actually come in the mail. We have recognized that we've missed a few people's addresses, but do let us know if you know that the address we have for you is wrong, or if you know the address we have for someone else is incorrect, just give us, drop us a quick line and let us know. But there is a very easy system for you to do this. 
Three ways to give to our church. To number one, just drop off your check in the mailbox at the church, which is checked and emptied daily. You can mail your check in to the church that way. It's just easy and it's here. Or you can, of course, use this new e-transfer system. Those of you who do e-transfers, you know it's really no big deal. It is a very safe, a very secure way of transferring money. And simply what it does is it takes the money from your bank account and deposits electronically that's the e transfers it electronically into the bank account at our church there is a separate email account for the church that is in that letter that will allow you to do that and frankly it's very simple to do a good number of you have done that already and we do appreciate that we want you to know that the reality is that most of our expenses at our church are fixed and so although we certainly are saving some money in terms of some of our programming, most of what we have to pay, we still have to pay even during this pandemic. So some of you have been very kind and committed and said, listen, when we're back together, we'll just bring in our offerings at that point. At some point, folks, we're gonna have to pay bills. Uh, with more than a promise from you to bring in our revenue later. So we really do need you to take advantage of one of these three ways to send in your money. And we also want you to know that the reality is that this is an opportunity for us to continue to fund the ministry that we want to keep going forward. We are trying to do what we can online. We're trying to do what we can in person. We're trying to keep within the restrictions here, but we want the gospel ministry at Downsview Baptist Church to continue to move forward. We don't want to just take a vacation and we aren't just simply saying, you know, we'll do as minimum, the minimum amount possible at our church. We are trying to press the envelope to see how we can continue to communicate with and proclaim the gospel of Christ along with our church family and those that are connected. As you could well imagine, there have been a number of people who we've been able to connect with through this, vi this video means. There are some of you perhaps that are watching that don't attend our church but by God's grace we have the opportunity to do this over the airways this way but the reality is that our church is funded by you the members of our church and so thank you for doing that it's starting to uh, become something that's a little more regular and if you take the time and opportunity to do that you have our thanks for that those are the announcements for our time this morning we're going to move forward with our church family's worship service at this point Good morning. Our Bible reading this morning is taken from Psalm chapter 40. It's entitled, My Help and My Deliverer. It is a Psalm of David to the choir master. Psalm 40, and I'll be reading it in the ESV. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction, out of the miry bog, and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. None can compare with you. I will proclaim and tell of them, yet they are more than can be told. In sacrifice and offering you have not delighted, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the scroll of the book. It is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. Behold, I have not restrained my lips, as you know, O Lord. I have not hidden your deliverance within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. As for you, O Lord, you will not restrain your mercy from me. Your steadfast love and your faithfulness will ever preserve me. For evils have encompassed me beyond number. My iniquities have overtaken me and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head. My heart fails me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. 
Let those be put to shame and disappointed altogether who seek to snatch away my life. Let those be turned back and brought to dishonor who delight in my hurt. Let those be appalled because of their shame who say to me, aha, aha. But may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say continually, great is the Lord. As for me, I am poor and needy, but the Lord takes thought for me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O oh my God. We know the Lord always blesses the reading of his word. So friends, this morning we are going to be exploring the word of God together again to seek to delve into it and to seek to grow by it. We'll do that as Jane has read for us in Psalm number 40 today. And we will do that for the express purpose of following up on last Sunday, which had much to do with us opening our mouths so that the next generation would know of the works of God and therefore know God himself. And having known God, they would set their hope in God. And obviously our concern is not only for young children, but it is no less for them. And we as the people of God here at Downs, you want to see to it that we would be those who are faithful to open our mouths, declare the goodness and the mercy of God in a way that others would therefore come to know who God is and to set their hope in God. Would you pray with me to that end, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning that we have yet another opportunity to come into the presence of Almighty God to bow before him, physically perhaps, but certainly in our minds and in our hearts. To do so, dear God, to the end, that our lives really would be shaped so that we'd be more like you. We want, Heavenly Father, for you to be honored in our lives. We want you, Heavenly Father, to be honored by being reflected in our lives. And so we ask for help. I ask for your help today. I ask, dear God, that you would cause me not to rely upon myself, but that you would cause all of my dependence to be upon you and your spirit. That I, along with all those who are listening and worshiping today, would find our confidence firmly grounded and constantly growing in who you are and how what you have done points us to who you are. So as we need your help, dear God, we pray, dear God, that you would give it, not because we need it as much as because your son died, that we might receive it. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. I wonder if I put a couple of pictures up on the screen, if you might know who these people are. This is a picture of a gentleman who to many of you may mean something. Some of you may be sharp enough to know who this is, but I'm certain that if I had just seen his picture on my own, I wouldn't know who it is either. Does this help you perhaps? Well, this helps you know something of him. But I wonder if I ask you who this is, if I give you this picture, does this help you? Yes, it, that's exactly right. Those of you who guessed, this is the first sub four minute mile ever run back in 1954 by Roger Bannister. Most of us don't know who Roger Bannister is if I simply say his name. But if I ask you who was the man who ran the first under four minute mile, we would at least remember the accomplishment and attach it to his person. Let's try another one. Anyone know who this is? I'm quite certain that I wouldn't know had I not come up with this. The clue, I mean, this might give you some idea who this person is. If I put up this picture, I bet you know exactly who this is. If you're still not sure who this is, who's walking on the moon, perhaps if I put 
a picture of the first footprint ever impressed upon the surface of the moon, you would recognize this gentleman as, yes, Neil Armstrong. You not, do you not connect Neil Armstrong's accomplishments with the person? Try this one. Most of you know this picture probably, and you're thinking, oh, I know that guy, who's, what's his name, right? Does, does this help you? He's a musician. Perhaps you'd even guess that he's a composer. Some symphony number no. five. Some of you may be helped by this picture. The very composition itself, Beethoven's fifth symphony, points to Ludwig von Beethoven. His accomplishment of that amazing task. Dun 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 dun. Dun 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 dun. You know the opening of that? That's Beethoven's fifth, and you can recognize the man by his music. One more. Anyone know who this is? Some of you. D does this picture help? something about him doesn't it so something about what he's doing in some kind of laboratory some kind of scientific experiment i imagine you know exactly who it is now when you see milk and milk being pasteurized and then bottled into bottles like this yes of course this is the pasteurization of milk which is directly connected to who Yes, Louis Pasteur, the actual process of purifying milk is connected directly to the man's name. What you have in these examples, friends, is I could, put up, could have put up four pictures of those folks. And you'd think, who, who are those guys? I, I don't understand who they are or any sense of significance. But what I'm sure you've recognized here, dear friends, is this truth, that identity is tied to accomplishment. That the identity of each of those folks was tied to what it was that they were able to achieve. And I do think that if you recognize that one of the realities in this world is where identity is tied to accomplishment, it's also true that memory is tied to identity. I remember who Roger Bannister is because I remember his accomplishment. And because of that, then isn't this true that memory is in fact tied to accomplishment? Since identity is tied to accomplishment, and I remember their identity, and the way I remember their identity is tied to their accomplishment. Do you not see the connection there to the Lord Jesus? We saw in Psalm 78 last week that the psalmist was extolling those who remembered the works of God, who transferred them to their children so that their children would remember what God had done and therefore what? Set their hope in God. In Psalm 78, verses 6 and 7. That the identity of God, the person of God, the reality of God is so tightly connected to God's accomplishments that the memory of God Remembering God, not forgetting God, and therefore putting our hope in God is tied to remembering what God has done. Friends, what the psalmist is telling us here in Psalm 40 today is very similar. And really, this is why we're in here in this psalm is to expand on that reality. That God is not just an abstract concept, but he must be realized that he is active in his person. But what I mean by that is, friends, that, that sometimes nowadays we can get this idea that God's just impersonal, an impersonal force, just a concept, right? Something that someone is, has, has conceived in their mind, conceptualized, but he's not this personal, active being the Lord and Savior of our lives, but nevertheless in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Having come incarnate, having been raised incarnate, being 
ascended into heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father, personally involved in the lives of his people to the degree that when we think of what Jesus has done, we understand something of who he is. And in understanding who he is, we put our hope in him. We place our trust in him. We commit our lives. We surrender our very beings to him. And so what's the charge? You want your children, your grandchildren, right? Your children's children to set their hope in God. Some of us, as we said last week, are so agonizing over adult children, older adult children who have yet to surrender to the beauty of Christ. This, dear friends, is a strategy to see God honored in our lives and theirs, that we should what? Point to the mercy of God with our lips. That's what our lives should be doing. That's what our lives should be marked by and I believe that's exactly what the psalmist here is pointing us to in Psalm number 40. So if you close your Bibles, please open them to Psalm number 40. As Jane has read for us, the book of Psalms is almost in the middle of your Bible. The large number are the chapter number. That's where we're going, chapter number 40. And the smaller numbers are the verses that you'll be able to follow along, follow along as we move forward here. I want to give much credit and thanksgiving to the Bible commentator, D.A. Carson, who has been an extraordinary help to me in organizing my thoughts, in particular in the way things are outlined today. I have uh, been, as I say, uh, very uh, indebted to him for that, and I just want to make that really clear that he's been a great help as we move along today. Paul David Tripp reminds us this concept of our lives as believers, that God blesses you with grace, not only because you need grace, but also so that you'd be his tool of grace in the lives of others. We are to be those who point to the mercy of God by the pronouncements of our lips. What comes out of our mouths should point to the mercy of God. And we'll begin by looking at this first section, the first 10 verses of Psalm 40, which is celebration. The second half is anticipation. So first we're celebrating where we've seen God's mercy. And secondly, we're going to be anticipating where we'll continue to need God's mercy. And so as we see God's identity tied to God's accomplishment, we recognize and we advertise how God has responded to us in mercy. And you notice that the psalmist is, is doing that in a very personal way. And he begins with his own personal reflection here in the first three verses. Let me remind you what happened there. I waited patiently for the Lord, the psalmist says, and he inclined to me and he heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction, out of the miry bog, and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He has now put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. David is reflecting on his personal interaction with the goodness, the kindness, the mercy of God. And as he personally reflects, it's interesting that you think, well, what has David done? Verse 1 says, I waited. He just waited. Now, in waiting, you are confident of an answer. That's why you're waiting. You're expecting of an answer. That's why you're persevering in your waiting. It says something about the one you're waiting for, the goodness of his character that you would wait, that you're able to expect him to come and deliver. But again, David is offering no works. David is offering nothing that is causing God to do these things. He's waiting in the midst of difficulty. What has God done? Verse 2 and 3, he has inclined to David. He has heard David's cry. He drew him up out of the mud. 
He set his feet upon the rock. He made his steps secure. He put a new song in his mouth. Isn't that amazing? That as David reflects on how this is and David celebrates God's mercy, he says, look, I just waited. And I watched God do all of these amazing things. And friends, never discount the idea that God is honored where you and I simply wait on the Lord to have our strength renewed, as the prophet Isaiah will say in chapter 40. But the first aspect is this personal reflection. I just waited for the Lord. And now he moves from per personal to public. Public revelation in verse three, the second half of verse three. He says, as he's waiting, and as God has done all these wonderful things, putting a new song in his mouth, many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Do you see the connection there? The effect of David's waiting and receiving from God and reflecting on that personally, others are going to see and they'll fear and they'll put their trust in the Lord as well. Can you suggest that, that just like David has seen and feared the Lord, that others who do what he has done they will receive it as well. There's not only his personal reflection, but there's this public revelation that it's revealed to others. And so David has a proposal. David has a suggestion here in verse four to six. Notice what he says. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. No, no, no. For you have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts towards us. None can compare with you. And so I will proclaim, I will tell of them, yet there are more that can be told. In fact, in sacrifice and offerings you've not delighted, but you've given me an open ear. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you have not required. And so David is saying to others, listen, it's not only me, but all who trust in God like this have the expectation of being blessed like I am. And those who have been blessed ought to proclaim his mercy as well. It's interesting as he says there in verse six, look, you have not set up requirements in me for me to be worthy of you pouring out your mercy on me. You, you've not set up things that you've got to do this, you've got to do this, you've got to do this. And once you have all these things in a row, ah, now I see you're worthy of mercy. Friends, mercy is giving what we don't deserve. It's withholding wrath that we do deserve. It is a whole concept of undeserving. David is saying, you haven't set up any requirements of me. It's not like you said, I've got to do these things or else I won't. God is pleased to dispense mercy. You've not required these things from me in order to cause you to pour out your mercy upon me. It's not what I can do for you as much. It, it is what you have done for me. That's, that's, where, that's where David's going. And it's interesting to me that David actually is quoted by the writer to the Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 10. If you have your Bibles there, look over at the 10th chapter, Hebrews, James, Peter. Just back up if you've gone to Peter or James, you'll find it in the last little bit of your Bible. Hebrews chapter 10. Notice there, as he is speaking, in chapter 10 of the law being but a shadow of the things that were to come, preparatory until the Messiah would come. These things that had to be done, which the Jews could have been confused into believing that these are the ways you were saved by keeping these certain laws, rather than the book of Hebrews saying they revealed their inability to do it and therefore their need for a savior. And the writer to this group of Hebrews who were themselves tempted to move back, he's saying, don't fall backwards, keep pressing forward. And he shows them how to keep pressing forward by actually quoting Psalm 40. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse five. 
Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, isn't it interesting that the words in Psalm 40, which we think, oh, it's a Psalm of David, and one level it is. On the other hand, it is the exact words of Christ through David. Sacrifices and offerings you've not desired, but a body you've prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, you've not taken pleasure. And then I said, behold, I've come to do your will. It is written of me in the scroll of the book. Now, verse 8, look at when he said, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. He goes on in down in verse 10. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. You see, he's saying it's the offering of Christ, which is where we find our assurance that's what's required not my sin offerings and guilt offerings not not mine but jesus therefore i'm relying on what jesus has done for me not what i've done for him i've done these things in preparation to meet him that's what the old covenant law was intended to do and now jesus has come and those things are put aside they've passed away as hebrews chapter 8 earlier would have told us the whole point here is that this public proposition, David saying, listen, if you trust God the way I've trusted God, if you wait on him, if you anticipate his blessings, if you call out to him for mercy, just like I've received it, you should receive it as well. And that's the assurance that, that you can have. And so therefore he moves on to this personal affirmation. He feels affirmed in his trust in the Lord. This is how I know that I am his. Then I said, behold, I've come. It is written in the scroll of, it is written in the scroll of the book. It is written of me, as we just read in there and in Hebrews. I delight to do your will, O oh my God. Your law is within my heart. Your law is within my heart. He's saying, I'm personally affirmed. I know I'm his because I what? It's written of me in the book. How do I know? Because I live to make him known. I live to make him celebrated amongst his people. How do I show that? I delight to do your will. Your law, your word, your expectation, your commandment has been so impressed upon my heart. My joy is to do what you want me to do. That's the kind of people who are written in the book. Not because we do his will is the cause for us to be in there. But since we are written in that book, this is a delight of those who are his own. And so he comes to this beautiful public proclamation. Personal, public, personal, public. He is personally affirmed. And therefore, out of that personal affirmation, he just cannot help but share the things that he loves to share. Because... I have told of the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation, not just evangelism, but discipleship, edifying of the saints. I have told the glad news of deliverance, of my deliverance, his testimony in the great congregation. Behold, I have not restrained my lips as you know, O Lord. Positively, I've told. Negatively, I haven't restrained my lips. Again. Negatively, I have not hidden your deliverance within my heart. Positively, I have spoken of your faithfulness and of your salvation. David says the good news will be understood as good news when the things that I discuss, talk, share, testify, encourage each other with are my own personal experiences of God's kindness. The great congregation within the people of God. I know sometimes there is a question that may come up in terms of our motivation. Why do we speak of Christ? Why should we evangelize? Why should we encourage each other in the Lord? Friends, the deeper in love you fall with Jesus, you can't help but speak about him. You can't help but speak about the things that grip you. You want to be more likely to speak up about Jesus? Then know more about Jesus. Fall deeper in love with Jesus. Live your life in the delight to do his will. And you will not be able to stop your mouth from speaking about the goodness 
of God. And dear friends, I have to ask, I have to ask ourselves the questions, why do we think it's okay not to be like this? How did we get to the point that we believe some kind of lie that I say, well, I'm just not like that. That's just this is not the kind of person I am. That's, that's not what I'm about. That's not how I'm wired. I don't want to. I don't like to. I'm not comfortable. Friends, what is David saying? He's saying, this is how I know I'm a Christian. This is what Christians do. They open their mouths to people within and without of the church. They can't help it. The identity and person of Christ is tied to his accomplishments and his accomplishments must be shared with others so that they will know who he is and why they should trust him as well. Oh, we, we, we sing, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, my great Redeemer's praise, the glory of my God and King, the triumph of his grace. I, I wish I had a thousand tongues, the hymn writer says. I just, I, so many opportunities, so many more opportunities, so many more faculties to open my mouth and let people know who I am. And yet, there, there's, there's something that's obviously unnatural about wanting to do that, a bit uncomfortable even. But he says, when your law is so impressed upon my heart, I delight. It's not laborious. It's a delight. It's a joy. It's a thrill. It's what I love to do. When you don't love to do it, when you'd rather not do it, when you can't be bothered doing it, when I'm just not like that, maybe the reason you're not like that, maybe the reason I'm not like that, you can draw your own conclusions from the psalm, can't you? When I never open my mouth about Jesus, it may be because my heart has never been revived to love Jesus. Yeah. Yes, yes, that is a possibility. We're not talking about every person being a vocational preacher. We're talking about sharing, pointing to the mercy of God with our lips, pointing to the goodness of God by what comes out of our lips, pointing to his sufficiency with what we have to say. It's not okay not to do this. He's not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. Sometimes folks are willing to say, I'd rather just let my, my life speak for me. I, I'd rather not speak up. I'd rather let my life speak for me. And so we adopt this. You've heard this. Preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, use words. With all due respect to Francis of Assisi, it is nonsense. It's not only nonsense, it's anti-gospel nonsense. It is anti-God blasphemy. The reason I say that is because God has made it crystal clear that the gospel is news. News is telling others about something that's happened. You have to use words. Just If I just am simply logical about it, no one is going to be saved by observing mine or your godly life, as godly as our lives might be. And the Bible is very clear, isn't it? In Romans chapter 10, preach the gospel. And since it's necessary, use words. Romans chapter 10 is absolutely clear that faith 
comes by hearing. Hearing comes by the word of Christ. Friends, if people don't hear people like you and I opening our mouths, pointing to Christ by proclaiming his mercy, they will, no, they will, no, no, they will not be saved. They have not been saved. People who tell you they have been, they're wrong. People who write stories about people who've never heard anyone talk about Jesus, but they're saved out somewhere in the, the hinterlands. That's simply anti-Bible. We've got to go and tell people. That's why the whole missionary movement got started. That's why William Carey went way across the world that he could bring the truths of the gospel because people will not be made right with God without the truth of the scriptures, without the gospel being proclaimed. With them understanding that there really is a God who is on over all and in all and above all, who calls us to live in a way that honors him, and everyone has fallen short of that. Everyone has ignored what they know to be true about God. He has revealed himself in creation, to be sure, and in our consciences, but not in a saving way, the Bible says. Because what he's revealed there, everyone has ignored. And yet the good news, the gospel, why it's good, is because God would send his own son, the very person of the Lord Jesus Christ, fully man, so that he could be our representative. Fully God, so he didn't have his own sin to pay for. And would go to this world, go to his own people. His people would reject him. He would go to the Gentiles. The Gentiles would reject him. And so he simply went to the cross, having lived a perfectly righteous life under the expectations, commands, and law of God, that he earns perfect righteousness for any who bow their knee to him, and then went to the cross to pay our debt, to set us free. Because we didn't live under the law as Jesus did, as we were called to, and we had a debt we couldn't pay. And so Jesus pays our debt. Jesus earns us perfect righteousness. And he says, you surrender to me. The good news of the gospel is that any who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Romans chapter 10 and verse 13. At the end of that passage, it reminds us that faith comes by hearing. Dear friends, to celebrate the mercy of God, the mouths of Christians at Downsview Baptist Church must be unlocked, opened. And trust the ministry and expect the ministry of the Holy Spirit as you wait upon him to give you the words to speak. And so that's the celebration. Secondly, there's an anticipation. And that's verses 11 to 17. That we must recognize and advertise how much we've received his mercy, number one, and celebrate it. Number two, how much we will need his mercy still more. Verse 11 to 17, we recognize there is a future care, future mercy of God to care for us coming. And it's just a series of things we must be certain of. Number one, be certain that you're going to get it. When it comes to the future need for mercy, be sure you're going to get it. That's what he says in verse 11. As for you, O Lord, you will not restrain your mercy from me. Your steadfast love and your faithfulness will ever preserve me, negatively and positively. He has these kind of juxtapositions throughout the psalm, so we get it. We have every reason to be certain that we will receive what we need from him. Secondly, we must be certain you're going to need it. The reason you're going to get it is because we're going to need it. Be certain of that. For evils have encompassed me beyond number. My iniquities have overtaken me. I cannot see. I couldn't do it without you. And I will not do it without you in the days ahead. I have every reason to believe I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it because I'm going to need it. Number three, cry out for it, therefore. I know I'm going to get it. I know I'm going to need it. I cry out for what I need from the Lord. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. 
Well, if you're going to get it, why would you ask for it? Are you kidding? If you know you're going to get it, that's why you'd ask for it. Of course I'm going to ask for something I'm sure I'm going to get, especially when I'm certain that I need it. Oh Lord, make haste to help me. I'm going to receive it because I'm going to need it. So I cry out for it. And in fact, I cry out for it specifically. Specifically in your particular circumstance. Oh, we are needy people, are we not? When we stop to think about it for five seconds. Do we look around and recognize the incredible provision of the Lord, not just what we need, but far more into what we want? But then we find ourselves short. We find ourselves discouraged. We find the, the money is short. The relationships are shot. The employment isn't what we thought it would be. Our health. We're so afraid these days for our health. When we get that little cough, a little tickle in our throat, what is it? What is it? Could it be? So he says, listen, cry out specifically for the mercy that you need. Because he's very personal here, isn't it? Let those be put to shame and disappointed altogether who seek to snatch away my life. Let those be turned back, brought to dishonor who delight in my hurt. He's got people in mind. Let those be appalled because of their shame who say to me, aha, aha, as if, you know, I thought God was going to take care of you. I thought God was going to give you all that you needed. It looks like they're going to have victory over him. He cries out for specific mercy for that particular situation, dear friends. Do that. Do that today, tonight before you go to sleep. Ask God specifically. Tell him exactly where your challenge is and ask for him, not because you're worth it, not because you need it, but because he is honored when he pours it out and you receive it. You and I want every problem in our lives solved with this conclusion. Wow, that was the mercy of God. How did I get to this place? That was the mercy of God. How did I get out of that? I got no answer but God's kindness. To God be the glory. Great things he has done. And so I know I'm going to get it. I know I'm going to need it. So I cry out for it. And I cry out for it specifically. And I cry out for the honor of the giver. Of the one who's been pleased to do that. That's exactly where we're connecting this. But may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Not just glad I'm out of that. Not just generic thankfulness, but be glad in the Lord himself. And friends, don't listen. Excuse me. Let me finish the verse. May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say continually. I love it. Great is the Lord. It's who he is. That's as marvelous as he is. As for me, I'm poor and needy. But the Lord takes thought from me. And now he turns his, his eyes to the Lord. May, Lord, you are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, oh my God. Do you see how personal, not an abstract concept, but active in his person, personally connected to the psalmist? You know, friends, we must say, don't resent your need for future care. But as for me, I'm, yeah, poor, I'm needy, I'm weak, I need your help. But anticipate what you've already begun to celebrate. And you think about the end of your life. Tombstones. Monuments like this. This is one of my historical heroes, tomb, C.H. Spurgeon in London. And on his tombstone, there is a very particular verse that comes from the hymn writer William Cooper, the roommate for a time of John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace. William Cooper wrote hymns as well. 
there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. But on Spurgeon's tombstone is this line, Ere since by faith I saw thy stream, thy flowing wound supply, redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die. Don't, don't you want that to be what people think about you? That, that since I saw Jesus with the eyes of faith, I saw his redeeming love, that's the theme of my life. That's a characteristic of my life. That's what marks my life, is this very testimony. Friends, what, what, what do you want on your tombstone? What, what do you want people to remember you by? What few little words, little snippets. What, what is it that people will say when they think about you? There are people who have seen their lives come to the brink in these last few months, haven't they? Lots of people have recovered. Lots of those people didn't know they were going to recover. If you and I find ourselves in that situation as we're facing the last breaths of our lives, and we think, what am I leaving behind for those children who I want to know the Lord? What are they going to think about Daddy? What will they remember about Grandma? What comes to mind when they think about Mommy? What, what marked my brother? What was it that was characteristic about my Auntie? What did my pastor live for? What did the people at our church believe? What did they stand for? We want to be those who are recognized as celebrating the mercy of God we've received and anticipating always in an ongoing way needing new mercy. So we can say at the end of our lives, Lord, I have told the glad news of deliverance. And I've told it in the great congregation. Behold, I have not restrained my lips. As you know, O Lord, Lord, I've not hidden your deliverance within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. Let that be the mark of Downsview Baptist Church, friends. Please pray with me to that end. We need God's help. Heavenly Father, we are desperately needy men and women at this church. And at times we even feel it. I pray we feel it now. I pray that we recommit ourselves or I pray we for the first time commit ourselves to opening the mouths you've given us and let wonderful truths of who you are by showing people what you've done. May that be the theme of our hearts and our lives. May that be what people think of us now and remember about us that our lives point past us to the wonderful deeds of the Lord. We humbly ask that you would hear our prayer through Christ. Amen.
Friends, it's been good for us to be able to honor the Lord and worship this morning. Our prayer is that God will give us grace to open our mouths, that we would take in the truth of God's word, treasure it deeply, and continue to open our mouths to transfer it, to proclaim the goodness of God to a needy and a watching world. Hear the word of the Lord in this benediction at the end of 2 Thessalonians as we bring our church service to a close. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 16. The Apostle Paul prays this for us. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with you all. Let's pray. Father, dismiss us back to our lives now. Lives that we pray would be covered, overlaid with your grace, protected from harm, and equipped for every good work. We want your name to be hallowed, to be made much of, to be honored in our lives. We ask the Holy Spirit to make it so in Christ's name. Amen.